my grandmother always said to me, you know, don't ever go to the South. When I actually did go to the South to do an artist residency again, but in Greenboro, North Carolina, I just remember going on the Dragon Bus from New York to Greensboro and going across the border into Virginia. And I remember it was like there was a lightning storm. It was very filmic, very dramatic, kind of. It was the middle of the night. Almost everybody else on the bus was asleep. There was lightning and thunder and rain. And I just remember seeing that sign, Virginia, you are now entering the state of Virginia. And just thinking this phrase came into my head, their blood is in the soil. And thinking, wow, that's what it meant to be a slave in America. America is founded on slavery. There wouldn't be an America without slavery. There wouldn't be a Canada without slavery. So it's not like we're these people that just popped up you know, 10 years ago or 100 years ago, we've been here for a long time and our blood is in the soil. In the beginning, during the times of slavery, white people, well, I think black people and white people went to churches together for a while and then the Jim Crow era came in and that, that's when segregation really happened. A lot of white people did not want black people to become Christians because that would mean that they were human beings with souls. And as we know, slaves were considered not humans, but livestock. If you look at all the old slave catalogs or entries, they're in with the horses, the pigs, and the cows. The slaves, like they're not people. They're livestock. When I think of a praise house, it's something that comes, that comes between the African spiritual practice that the people who first landed on in the new world, so-called new world, but we know it wasn't in the new world because there are already people here, But when they landed in America, they went from their Africanisms, which in the way, by the way, in America were forbidden. Like you couldn't speak your African language. You couldn't have your African name. You couldn't, you know, play drums, et cetera, et cetera. It was forbidden. But of course, people went into the woods and tried to keep those things alive as much as they could. So for me, a praise house is something between the Africans, original African spiritual practices on their way to Christianity. Usually praise houses were just little, very plain looking shacks because you have to remember, I mean, even our African Methodist Episcopal Church, we didn't have decorations in there because, you know, you have to understand where those places were coming from. Anything could be interpreted and used against you, you know? That's why I love the whole tradition of yard art and art with found objects in the American South. I started learning about incredible artists like Thornton Dial and Bill Trailor and Clementine Hunter and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you realize that, yes, black people did have powerful art forms, but they were usually in their houses or just like yard art in in their yards. And people would look at it and think, oh, that's eccentric. But in a funny kind of a way, black people don't like to, have, like to have things that draw attention to themselves in a funny way because, well, that's always trouble. That always leads to lynching and jail and blah, 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 you know? So even our art was, our visual art was sort of segued into a place that seemed safer probably. When I have something on the roof of the spirit house, They sold us like beasts. They counted our teeth. I mean, there's all kinds of things on there that denote a journey towards maybe Christianity, but also are rooted in Africa. I wanted it to look like a a combination of a, a sacrificial bull and a ship because it represents, you know, the fact that the original Africans came on a ship And then I want to, but I wanted it to also be like a sacrificial bowl in a way to honor the people that were sacrificed so that I could be here today. Well, again, we're talking about that idea of the larger society just being tone deaf to what we're saying and what we're going through. It's like you have to keep repeating it. Decade after decade, you have to keep repeating the same thing. And now, are they really starting to listen? I hope so.
Are they really starting to see? Maybe because of the new technology and the phones and whatever. I mean, you know, when Eric Garner was killed, people are going, oh my God, that's horrible. Like, look at, they just killed that guy. And black people are going, they do it every day for hundreds of years. They've been doing it every day. I'm sure indigenous people are saying the same thing. Blah, blah, blah. And, but you haven't believed what we've been saying. We've been telling you that this has been going on for hundreds of years, but you're not listening. But I suppose now that you're seeing with your own eyes, now you're listening. You know, so it's the same thing with my work up till now. It's like you have to just find new ways to say the same thing and hope that people are finally going to open their eyes and their ears. I don't like to tell people what to think about my work or how to feel about my work, so I leave what they think or feel. I mean, what they think or feel is up to them, you know? It depends on how open they are, are into seeing and understanding what they're seeing. I usually think of my work, there's, I work, but there's many layers to the work I'm making. So you can just look at a piece of work, and if you're only kind of in this, into the surface visual whatever, that's what you're going to see. But if you're into learning, or if you are learning, or if you're interested in learning, you'll see many different layers of things in my work to see. So. But that's up to the individual. I don't like to tell them what to think or see. Half the time, I don't even see what I see years later. <laughs> so, you know.